Aren't you lucky to have someone guide you in reading and summarizing a legal case? You know, reading and, write and summarizing a legal case is one of the most daunting tasks that any law student has to endure in his or her studies. You have to find the case, you have to read the case, you have to find the most important elements of the case, and then you are expected to write a comprehensive summary of all the elements that make up the case. Our summary today is based on the Ace versus Zuma and another, a case that was heard and decided by the Constitutional Court in 1995. This video takes you through a step-by-step -step guide and I hope you find it useful. But before we proceed, please remember to click the like and the subscribe buttons below and press that notification bell and share it with your friends so that you may be notified in future when another video is posted. Otherwise, remember to contact me at iClassVirtual at gmail.com. Follow me at Twitter at iClassVirtual as well as on my Facebook page, which is Pilanli Tandan and Law. Thank you very much for taking your time to listen to this video and I hope you find it useful and informative. As you can see from our screen image there uh, and the citation there is visible, it is a case between S. Zuma, uh, rather it's the state versus Zuma and another or others. Uh, it was uh, enrolled as case number CCT5 stroke 95. That was in the year 1995 and heard by the Constitutional Court. Zuma and others came in as applicants because remember it was an appeal from the Deppen High Court. In fact, not an appeal, it was a direct access case. Uh, I will look, we will explain that as we go down. So the Zuma and others were applicants whilst the state was the respondent. Now the matter was heard on the 23rd of February 1995 and judgment was delivered on the 5th of April of the same year, that's 1995. The, the judgment was delivered by a, a Kent Reed Kent Rich as a, an acting judge, uh, whilst the rest of the other constitutional court judges concurred. Uh, you will want to also know that this was an interlocutory matter from the Deben High Court on the admissibility of certain evidence, that is confessions made before uh, officers who are not the magistrate or peace officer. Um, the, the opening remarks are, you know, they, they outline what some people want to call the, the procedural posture of the case to, to, to give a background of where it began, how it began, how the Constitutional Court found itself seized with the matter. So, it's very important to take note of uh, the procedural pros uh, posture of the case because that is what is covered here. We organize our summary or our study of the state versus Zuma and another case uh, by looking at, a, you know, we're making a summary of facts we look at the legal question, we look at the ratio decidendi, and then the findings of the court. Um, as we go down, it's going to be clear what we mean by that. But some people want to organize their thoughts uh, along the lines of an acronym that is called a, a FIRAC uh, uh, structure, where it's a fact issue rule and application of the rule, then a conclusion. So you can notice that here, our summary of facts runs parallel to the fact in the FIRA, in the FIRAC structure, and then the legal question will be the issue that the court has to decide or determine, 
and then the ratio dead dissidentity that is our reasons for the finding we were looking at the applicable rule and how that rule is applied to the specific uh, facts at hand and then the finding runs uh, um, side by side or parallel to the conclusion the facts of the case were stated as follows in paragraph 7 of the case according to uh, Kentridge J.A. The accused were indicted on two counts of murder and one of robbery. At their trial before the judge Hugo, that is at Deben High Court, where he said with assessors, the accused pleaded not guilty. Two of the accused, however, had made uh, statements before a magistrate which counsel for the state tendered as admissible confessions. Now, admissibility of uh, these confessions was con contested by counsel. Uh, that is the counsel for the accused um, contended that uh, th these uh, confessions should not be admitted as evidence. So that was within the context of a court, I mean, a trial within a, a, a trial. And so it was decided to refer the matter to the Constitutional Court to determine whether such uh, con um, confessions should actually be admitted as evidence in the trial. Um, the legal question, which was the issue, uh, the legal question emanated from section 217 of the Criminal Procedure Act uh, 51 of 1955, uh, which made it possible for a court to make a conviction of an accused on an offense even if his guilt was not proved beyond reasonable doubt. So the question was whether uh, Section 217 of the Criminal Procedure Act violated the Constitution that then was the Constitutional Act 200 of 1993, which is the interim Constitution, uh, particularly Section 25 of that Constitution, which dealt with the rights of the accused of the arrested and accused persons which would be parallel to our current uh, section 35 of the 1996 constitution uh, as well as uh, <clears throat> you know considering whether uh, section 33 or which was then as compared now to section 36 uh, which is a limitation uh, clause could actually justify such uh, an application of a uh, reverse honors so because it was noted that uh, you know section 217 um, somehow a certain proviso uh, imposed a reverse honors on the accused and another issue to be considered was whether if section 30 um, section 217 did not violate uh, the constitution whether it uh, passed the section 33 master, that is our current se uh, section 36 provisions. The judge referred to the Constitutional Court for decision, the question of uh, particularly section 217 1B2 of the Criminal Procedure Act for consistency with the 1993 constitution and if so if he found to be uh, unconstitutional then he was asked to declare it invalid and there was the subject of direct access to the constitutional court whether uh, the, the, you know the, the judge Hugo was justified in stopping the trial and referring the matter to the constitutional court so uh, after looking at uh, the constitution the then constitution and the rules of of of, of court 
in terms of section 100 of that constitution and uh, the rule uh, number 17 uh, direct access was granted and so as i have already said above section 217 dealt with the admissibility of evidence of a confession made by an accused person before trial subsections one and two therefore read as follows uh, evidence of any confession made by any person in relation to the commission of an, any offense shall if such confession is proved to have been freely and voluntarily made by such person in his sound and sober senses and without having full, been unduly influenced thereto be admissible in evidence against such person at criminal proceedings relating to such offense now you must take note here that the words to be underlined are voluntary and uh, freely and voluntarily made provided that such a confession made to a peace officer other than a magistrate or justice or in the case of a peace officer referred to in section 334 that uh, act uh, the confession made to such a peace officer which relates to the offense with reference to such peace officer is authorized to exercise any power conferred upon him under that section that one shall not be admissible in evidence unless confirmed or reduced to writing in the presence of a magistrate so those were the issues but uh, the next proviso is what we must take note of um it went on to say provided that where the confession is made to a magistrate and reduced to writing by him or is confirmed and reduced to writing in the presence of the magistrate the confession shall upon mere production thereof at the proceedings in the question be admissible in evidence against such person if it appears from the document in which the confession is con uh, contained that the confession was made by a person whose name corresponds to that of the such person and in the case of a confession made to a magistrate or confirmed in the presence of a magistrate to, through the interpreter uh, if the certificate by the interpreter appears on such document to have the effect that the inter the in that he interpreted truly and correctly to the best of his ability with regard to the contents of the confession and any question put to such person by the magistrate and take note of uh, the, what follows what comes after this and be presumed unless the contrary is proved to have been freely and voluntarily made by such person in his sound and sober senses and without having been unduly influenced thereto it if it appears from the document in which the confession is contained that the confession was made freely and voluntarily by such a um, person in his sound and sober senses and without having been unduly influenced thereto so the words to be underlined here are unless the contrary is proved so in this particular case <clears throat> a state rather the state or its council could actually present before the court what was uh, taken as a, a a confession of all the elements of of the crime and uh, as long as uh, you know the, the the counsel for the state presents uh, that statement or that confession it would be admissible in court unless the contrary is proved so now who must prove the contrary it is the accused so taking a closer look at this you get the impression that uh, this uh, the, the the words there unless the contrary is proved are actually placing an onus upon an accused to prove his innocence before the court uh, that's what some people call a statutory presumption or a reverse onus provision and it is it is the, the 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 justification or the justifiability of uh, the existence of uh, such a, a clause that uh, this matter was brought before for, for the constitutional court for consideration whether by expecting an accused to to prove the contrary 
the, 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 the law was not imposing an, you know, an undue burden on the accused. So, as, as we have just said above, the question is whether a reverse owner's provisions have a place in criminal trials. Because Section 217.1.B.2, uh, you know, described as a legal uh, presumption, where the presumed effect must be disproved by the accused on a balance of probabilities instead of by referring or rather by mere raising of the evidence to the contrary. So it is a reverse onus. If you look at paragraph 24 of the S. Versa Zuma case, this case that we are studying, uh, which places the burden on the accused to prove his innocence unless the contrary is proved. And prosecution is allowed or yeah, permitted to lead evidence in reputal. And this is a burden some and contrary, you know, um, requirement placed on. on, on the accused and it violates in a way the principle of a presumption of innocence because remember everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty and it is not the duty of uh, the, 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 the accused to prove his innocence but it is the duty of the state to prove the, the guilt before, beyond reasonable doubt. So, having considered a, a lot of issues, you find that uh, this came as the reason for the judgment. Uh, the court considered the principles of the constitutional inter interpretation in respect of Section 25, whether the rights of uh, the accused and arrested persons were being infringed by this Section 217 particularly the proviso that we've just referred to above, whether the principle of a fair trial uh, to be understood in the context of uh, historical circumstances giving rise to it had been violated. For instance, if the law expects an accused to prove innocence, is that not a violation of uh, the rights to a fair trial? And then at paragraph 16, the court noted that Section 25 requires criminal trials to be conducted in, court, in accordance with the, the notions of basic fairness and justice. That's contrary to the S versus Rootman and another, as well as the S versus Mtwana 1992. You know, these two cases had been dis, um, decided before the advent of uh, the new constitutional dispensation in April 1994. So uh, the basic notions of fairness and justice had not been upheld uh, before 1994. So the court considered the operation of the reverse or honors provisions in other comparative jurisdictions, namely the USA and Canada, and it observed that a, a reverse honors clause runs against the due process of the law and the requirement of a rational connection between the clause and the facts proved was found not to be sufficient. So Kentridge in paragraph 21 indicated that uh, this requirement that there should be a rational connection between uh, the, the clause, uh, that is the requirement for, you know, admissibility of such a, a, a confession and then the objective sought to be achieved. He said that that was not sufficient. So considering U.S. courts, he found that they regarded the criminal uh, statutory presumptions as irrational and arbitrary. And he relied on the Canadian jurisprudence, particularly the case of R. v. Downey of 1990, uh, which was decided by Judge Corey. Uh, Kendrick noted that the presumption of innocence is actually an infringement whenever the accused is liable to be convicted despite the existence of a reasonable doubt. And uh, he noticed that if by the provisions of the statutory a presumption an accused is required to establish, that is to say, prove what is proved on a balance of probabilities, either an element of the offense or, the, or to give an excuse then it was a contravention of section 25 of the 
interim constitution of South Africa because uh, such a provision would invariably permit a conviction in spite of a reasonable doubt. So the, as I have already said above, the issue of a rational connection was found not to be uh, sufficient. And uh, the issue of the presumption of innocence had already been well established uh, in the 1935 uh, English law case of Holmington versus Director of Public uh, Prosecutions, where it was noted that it is not the duty of the accused to prove his innocence, but it is the duty of the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused without uh, any reasonable doubt. Of course, the issue of uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt is the quantum of proof in criminal law proceedings. And so it was found that uh, there should have been such a... In fact, in all cases, the reverse honors provision would not stand because of that. Further, they looked at the common law rule to prove that a confession was voluntary and integral. Uh, in fact, uh, that common rule was an integral element or essential element of the right to remain silent after arrest. You see, admissibility of confessions made to the police officers or any investigating officer would actually run contrary to the principle of the presum uh, presumption of innocence, what they call in the American jurisdiction the, the Miranda warnings, whereby a police officer arresting a particular person must remind them of their rights to remain silent and the, you know, the privilege not to self-incriminate, as well as the, the right not to be a compelable witness against oneself. So, uh, Kentridge found that uh, Section 217 and the associated provisos, if uh, they were meant to, 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 to survive the constitutional scrutiny, then there would actually be a violation of these common law principles. And uh, he felt that, in fact, he, he reasoned that uh, they should not uh, pass that test. The conclusion, therefore, of the case, uh, according to Kentry J, was that uh, as a result of the survey, the common law rule in, the, in regard to the pattern of proving that a confession was voluntary had not been a fortuitous one, but an integral and essential part of the right to remain silent. I've already alluded to that part in the foregoing. So those arrested must be reminded. And therefore, the issue of allowing or accepting such confessions and admitting them as evidence would actually violate the rights of the accused. And in some instances, it would even motivate the police and investigating officers to use unscrupulous means to obtain evidence, to torture people, torture accused persons, to, you know, induce them through unlawful means. And uh, certainly that runs against section, the current section 35 of the constitution, which uh, notes that evidence obtained in violation of the law and of the constitution should not be uh, admitted. We will accept that, of course, uh, there, there needs to be, there is need to strike a balance between uh, proper administration of justice where accused persons who make confessions should not be let to go, to go scot free. At the same time, you know, taking the history of torture, uh, you know, in interrogation in the chambers and so on, police chambers, you find that. Uh, so the, the issue of allowing um, these uh, police to use unscrupulous means should be discouraged by all means. And therefore, the inadmissibility of uh, confessions obtained in the absence of proper procedures 
is actually meant to quell that temptation by the police to induce, that is, police and all other investigating officers to induce uh, accused persons, uh, you know, to make admissions and confessions which naturally they would not have wanted to make. And um, of course, the issue of direct access to the constitutional uh, court was granted, as I have already alluded to above, in terms of section 102 of the Constitution of 1993, Rule 17, Sub Rule 1, because the, the, the court felt that uh, the matter was urgent and uh, delay in the execution of matters to do with it would actually prejudice many and it would actually affect the administration of, of justice. And then section 217 was also found not to meet the strict article requirements of section 33 then which has been uh, incorporated in the current constitution as section 36 regarding the limitation of rights in terms of a law of general application and all the other attendant uh, requirements imposed by section 36. And then country J went on to outline as a disclaimer that not all presu presumptions or reverse honors provisions were being declared unconstitutional. Uh, in other words, it was the unconstitutionality of section 217 of the Criminal Procedure Act of uh, 1955, which was in question. So he noted that uh, the law still would have to make provision for some reverse honors provisions uh, in many other instances where that would be applicable. Clearly, in terms of our, our analysis,